Thank you for joining us for this evening's event. My name is Kim and I'm one of the event hosts here at Pals Books in Portland, Oregon. Before we get started, I want to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website, pals.com. One of the many events we're looking forward to is Brandon Taylor in conversation with Phil Clay about Taylor's new story collection, Filthy Animals. That event is on Wednesday, June 30th. And if you don't already do so, please follow us on social media. Tonight, we are so excited to welcome Matthew Clark Davison and Tikira Mahe Ala. Let me try this. Mahe Alana, Mahe Alani Madden. Sorry about that. Matthew. That's great. <laughs> Matthew Clark Davison is full time faculty in creative writing at San Francisco State University and creator and teacher of the lab, writing classes with MCD a non-academic school started in 2007 in a friend's living room. The textbook version of the lab co-authored by best-selling author Alice LaPlante will be published by W.W. W. Norton in 2022. His prose has been recently anthologized in Empty the Pews and 580 Split and published in or on Guernica, the Atlantic Monthly and others. Matthew has been recognized with a uh, Creative Work Grant, Cultural Equities Grant, Clark Gross Award for a Novel in Progress, and a Stonewall Alumni Award. Davison's debut novel, Doub Doubting Thomas, chronicles a challenging and disruptive year in the life of a young gay teacher in the waning years of Obama's America. Thomas McGurin is a fourth grade teacher and openly gay man at a private primary school serving Portland, Oregon's wealthy progressive elite when he is falsely accused of inappropriately touching a male student. Davison's novel explores the discrepancy between the progressive ideals and persistent negative stereotypes among the privileged regarding social status, race, and sexual orientation, and the impact of that discrepancy on friendships and family relations. By turns rueful, humorous, angry, and wise, Doubting Thomas marks the debut of an important writer. Joining Davison in conversation this evening is T. Kira Mahayalani Madden. Madden is a queer AAPI writer, photographer, and amateur magi magician. A recipient of fellowships from the New York Foundation for the Arts, Hedgebrook, Tin House, McDowell, and Yado, she serves as the founding editor in chief of No Tokens, a magazine of literature and art. Her fiction and nonfiction have been featured in Harper's, New York Magazine, and others, and she is the author of the 2019 New York Times Editor's Choice Memoir, Long Live the Tribe of Fatherless Girls, a finalist for the National Books Critics Circle Award and the Lambda Literary Award for Lesbian Memoir. This evening's event will include an audience Q&A. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you would like to ask a question. As, as well, if someone has typed in a question that you would also like to know the answer to, please upvote that particular question by clicking the thumbs up button. Most importantly, please consider supporting Matthew and Pals by purchasing a copy of his new book from us. A link to buy Doubting Thomas, along with a link to Tikira's memoir will be shared in the chat a couple of times this evening. Matthew and Tikira, what a welcome, what a joy to welcome you both. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Kim. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, Matthew, I would love if you could start us out reading from your beautiful book before we begin our conversation. Sure. Thanks, Kira. Thanks for being here with me. And thank you so much, Powell's, for having me. I'm just thrilled to be here because I've been in Powell's and I can't believe as we inch closer to being together again in person, um, having our days and evenings return to us. I can't wait to go back to Powell's again. So I, I'm just gonna read the last little section of the first chapter before um, this happens, you find out that um, Thomas, uh, a kid in Thomas's class needed to help with his pants and Thomas helped him with his pants. And then the kid accurately described to his parents, um, you know, Thomas touched my pants and then something went, haywire in the imagination of the parents and the community as a result of uh, um, how they interpreted that. And then they have this town hall at Country Day, the imaginary school where I set the, the, this part of the novel. 
And this is the last part of the town hall. And if there's names of people, it's just the parents in the community. Jerome is Thomas's lawyer. Jerome sitting next to him touched his arm as the final participants made their way back into the room. Mrs. J looked directly at Thomas for the first time since the town hall began. Her skin appeared slightly swollen, a youthful, vulnerable look that verged on sexual. She didn't get the attention she deserved. All eyes, the mothers and Kenneths and Ryans, seemed to land on Conrad's because of his goofy good looks and rugby player's body. The other dads commented on his luck, rock climbing and golfing and trekking while his rich wife worked and his only kid went to school. Thomas imagined Mrs. J naked under her shirt dress and remembered himself a kid at the library with his brother James. The two holed up in a corner studying the bodies of women in, in medical texts, women who are underweight or overweight or suffering with crooked spines and bowed legs, lactating women, women with two very differently sized breasts, how entirely unanimated they were standing there, captioned with case study numbers beneath them, and how different his reaction was from his brothers who tore out the torsos with large round breasts and tucked the images into his wallet. Mrs. J maintained eye contact with Thomas until her expression, expression shifted, deflated. He imagined her with that same look, hunching down next to her son, pointing to his penis and asking, are you sure he didn't touch you here? Repeating it until his no turned, I don't know, turned maybe, turned yes. As they summarized and recapped the earlier details of the investigation's findings, their talk sounded like a television playing in a room next door. It should have been comforting because they iterated and reiterated Thomas's innocence, or as they put it, lack of evidence sufficient to press criminal charges, and provided the community access to the adult witnesses. They brought copies of the transcripts of the police interviews and the DA's investigation and used the word transparency a lot. Country Day had hired child psychologists to interview Toby's classmates. Printouts of their summarized findings had been circulated and both psychologists answered questions. Because of this, because of the facts, he hadn't until today quite grasped what was happening here, even though Jerome had told him. Up until this morning's headline, Thomas had said, no, you don't know the parents at Country Day. This isn't the school we attended as kids. Students at my school have two dads with two moms. You're worried about the wrong thing. Thomas thought Jerome should focus on getting him back into the classroom because he worried about the effect the misunderstanding would have on his kid's learning. He reached down, fingered the raw skin on his ankle, and as Jerome talked, everything seemed off, a bit blurry and difficult to follow. Thomas started to see it. Jerome wanted Thomas's presence to push country dayers into saying things he could gather for the civil case. From across the divide, Mercy, Thomas's boss, listened, took notes, nodded, and Thomas remembered the day he had met her, the day of his interview, summer of 2001. Her office sparkled, all glass and wood, surrounded by country days near choking foliage, wet and green, the drops on the glass and the glass itself created tiny prisms that fractured light from the early morning sun. She looked much younger in person than in the photograph on the website. In person, she wore glasses and her hair looked natural with caramel tinted highlights along the tops and ends, which added even more dimension to her face with its soft angles and rounded lines, except for the sharpness of her cheekbones. Her gestures, like using muscles around her nose to move her glasses higher on its bridge so she could continue to use both hands for papers, revealed a nerdiness that endeared Thomas to her because he recognized them in himself and other teachers. On the website's photo, I mean, on the website's photo, she had worn contacts and sported a wig, the same one she wore now, a style Thomas associated with Diane Carroll, perhaps because in person, Mercy's features had also reminded Thomas of the actress, even if her body language did not. Both had arched brows and wide brown eyes. So she had said the day of his interview, interrupting after listening to Thomas lament about worksheets and teaching to testing and his ideas for project-based learning model he dreamt of bringing to Country Day. 
I was a scholarship student at Country Day, one of the fewer than 10 African-American students and the only black person with a scholarship during the decade of my course of study. Back then, they gave one scholarship per year. There were no openly LGBTQ students or faculty then. So I think I'm gonna stop there and thank everyone so much for coming. I'm gonna clap for a minute so we can pretend that you can hear the whole room clapping for you, Matthew, which is the thing that I miss most in these Zoom rooms. Um, thank you so much for reading that. That was so beautiful. Um, it was really difficult, as you know, for me to choose a, a request because there are so many incredible passages in this book. Um, and I do want to talk about the ending at some point too, because of our conversation about that. Um, yeah, you've got some clap, clap, clap in the chat box too. Everyone, please use the chat box and please drop uh, drop questions in the Q and A box whenever you feel moved to do so. You don't have to wait till the end. Um, if I can incorporate them into our conversation, I will. Otherwise, there will be time for that as well. Um, Matthew, I know that you have talked in some interviews about the kernel of this project and this book. Um, something that you witnessed and overheard. So I wondered if you wanted to share that, but I'm also, as you know, uh, a little bit craft and process obsessed. And I know you are too. Um, you are both a writer and a person and a, a teacher and instructor that I admire so much. Um, so I wanna geek out on some process questions with you as well. So beyond that conversation that you might share with us, I'd love to ask you about just the basic, how did you come up with this really beautiful, like musical structure of this book? Like, how do you decide where to begin um, the different lengths of each chapter and how they move through time rather than a strictly chronological um, kind of point of telling? I, I'm just curious, like, what was the process of this, of this baby of yours? Tell us about it. Um. Thanks, that's such a great question. I mean, the, the thing that happened was my, my younger brother, Paul, um, who Jake is a highly fictionalized, and by the way, I do have a train that goes through my backyard. So if you're hearing the horn, um, it's rooting for all writers. <laughs> um, the, the, my, my younger brother, Paul had, um, well, I had an idea in my head. Let me just back up a tiny bit. I had an idea in my head about a gay guy who um, gets, um, you know, ends up having custody of a kid. And I was being, when once I, some of my nieces are here, Madeline, my uh, um, oldest niece is here. When Madeline 22 years ago was a, was a baby, um, I, I realized when I would hold her or when um, my brother's in-laws were around, when before I knew my sister-in-law very well and when her in-laws were there, I had a self, certain self-consciousness just in holding a baby because I was an out gay person. And I think that because I grew up during a time where there were um, absolute targeted conflations around um, it, child molestation and um, sort of out gay people as if they were the same thing. I couldn't relax and be myself, but then I'm a kid inside. I mean, my childhood was um, up and down and, but I, I maintained this sort of childlike part of me that really came out when I was around my nieces and people were constantly telling me you would be an amazing parent. And so I think that somewhere inside of my head, the, this idea of like among the trio of my own brothers, who is a parent and who isn't, given what our all of our different backgrounds were and what our personalities were, was something that was inside of my head for a really long time. But I couldn't quite figure out a way to write about it until I had finished Justin Torres's novel, We the Animals. And his book didn't really get me thinking about these characters because of his book, but um, it reminded me so much of what it was like to be a kid with brothers. Um, I, I was in a trial and error phase where I was working on other things and um, I had decided that one of the characters was gonna get cancer. My brother got cancer. I couldn't continue in the fictionalized cancer realm because it was too scary. So I put it off and for the time that I put it off, this, this 
anecdotes, this thing that happened in real life, where a concerned adult saw a out gay fourth grade teacher touch a child's shoulders and then tell an administrator that he felt that the, the, the teacher had touched the child inappropriately. That's somehow, and then my brother recovering from cancer, those two things became an intertwined in my, in my imagination somehow, and I started writing it. So, and then um, Takira, just to uh, um, answer your um, question about craft, it's funny that you should say the musicality of it because I had been working on such a voice driven novel for so many years um, that was so voice driven and so like in a way I was paying attention to the sentence and the poetic image in the sentence that I just wanted to write in plain English. I just wanted to write like simple declarative sentences. And I was blown away by uh, Marilyn Robinson's Gilead. And I felt like it was th the gorgeousness, like the, the thing that seemed to me gorgeous, it brought no attention to itself. It was just these simple sentences back to back that somehow made me feel tons of things. So I, I was I wasn't interested in an intellectual pursuit or political pursuit. I was interested in feeling things. I love that, Matthew. And I saw in another interview, or maybe it was your event with Paul, um, and you had talked about We the Animals and how that book reads almost like a prose poem, and it does, and how you were interested in this kind of simple language and um, veering away from lyricism. But I'm going to have to disagree with you that I think this book is a prose poem as well. Um, it has the musicality. I think even what we just heard, um, I think you were achieving both. And I think it just says so much about where your standards are in terms of sonics and the construction of a sentence that I was just reading so many passages of this aloud over and over again to learn from the sound and the music of what you've done here. So thank you for that. And that care is still apparent even if you are making an effort um, to veer away from it. I, I, was, I think that I had discovered that maybe I had fallen into that like some of my favorite, favorite writers write so beautifully and prosaically. And I read something that you had written recently. I can't remember if it was on social media or in an interview or something where you had said something and I'm not gonna get it completely right, T. Kira, sorry, because I've been reading a ton of things. Um, but the um, you had said something like you loved really um, heady, nerdy, maybe even academic um, essays and then uh, a, and also a certain kind of story, but realize that that wasn't what it is that you write. And I think, you know, I'm so glad that I tried so hard to apprentice to be more like the, the brilliant writers who I admire, but eventually I think each project finds its own voice. And I knew that I was sort of, um, you know, not going to get the um, sort of, the, the kind of reception that one gets when they're trying to be highly poetic in chapter one. Um, I knew that it was gonna have to be something different for me in this project. So who knows what I'll do with the next one. It's one of the most brilliant openings I think I've ever read. Um, if you all haven't read this book yet, you will be so gripped from that first chapter and on. It really doesn't let go. Um, it's just, this chapter is an, a masterclass on openings. Um, yeah, and I think I know exactly what you're talking about, that I had been chasing uh, voices that were not mine and stories that weren't really mine because they were considered serious literature or because certain texts are centered in certain institutions. And I see um, our mutual friend Annie Wood in the <gasps> audience, and I really always thank Annie Wood for introducing me to just like the work that really changed my life, um, introducing me to a book like Black Tickets and Jane and Phillips and yes. understanding the short story <laughs> form and the music that we're talking about and finding what I could offer, maybe, mm -hmm. uh, maybe mm -hmm. one day. Um, you mentioned We the Animals and I'd read that you called it the book almost a fan fiction of that and I find it really helpful sometimes to find those North Star model books. Um, I know we're also fans of Mary Gateskill and you've mentioned The Other Place as an instructive text for you in this book. So what's your relationship to, to finding those North Stars or finding models or finding um, whether it's structural kind of constraints like how do you maybe for students in the audience to like generate from 
those those texts from those inspirations? Well, I, I become obsessed with them. I think that I'm, I'm, I'm scrolling through here. It's really distracting for me. So I'm going to stop this off. And because I, <laughs> all I want to do is talk to people, but there are um, some big Mary Gateskill fans in the, um, <clears throat> in the house. Um, the other place, well, I think that what ends up happening to me is that um, with certain books, I have to read them out loud. I remember I, when I moved to Italy, I, I had so little room in my, I was broke. And so I couldn't bring a lot of stuff with me because um, beyond a certain amount of um, luggage, you got charged for it. And so I only got to bring a few books. And one of the books that I brought um, was um, Beloved. And I, I was really lonely. Like when I was in New York, I mean, when I was in New York, when I was in Italy, it was not, as I like to say, under the Tuscan sun. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't a, uh, the romanticized version of that. I was really, really lonely. I was going through a super rough time. I um, was super isolated in a lot of different ways. And uh, um, I started rereading re Beloved. And I just remembered there was like a certain passage that one that, where she talks about loneliness that, and it rocks you. And I remember I had to get up out of my futon bed and walk and read it out loud. And my roommate and her boyfriend were home. And I remember they, they thought, I think that they were going to call them the police because they thought that I had had like a, a nervous breakdown or something. Um, but there, I just become obsessed. A huge gift to me has been the Pushcart Anthology every year. The thing that I love about the Pushcart Anthology is that the one lone queer a hundred years ago that won a Pushcart has ever since been nominating. And the same thing for all sorts of other um, historically marginalized um, communities of writers, they they win a push cart and then they start nominating other stories that don't necessarily not only, you know, I'm not talking about identity markers, but I'm also talking about so many different styles of fiction have shown up in and nonfiction and poetry have shown up in the push cart over the years. And uh, um, often that's how I discovered Melanie Rayton, who I know that you and I both um, love and how I discovered um, Oh my gosh, have you read short stories by Latoya Watkins? Or there's um, also, um, uh, there's, there's another one that I know that all of us, many of us in word nerds in the room love that's not coming immediately into my head, but it will. And um, so I think that I may have read my first Mary Gates school story there. But then the other place, I honestly became obsessed with that story because Jennifer Egan does the most amazing reading of it in the New Yorker podcast, which is free to everyone. Mm. Um, and it's such a creepy, intense, wonderful story. And That's I right. think that she, she too, she does a bunch of things that I wish I could do that I have never yet achieved. I think that she's one of those people that has like access to some aspect of humanity that is not normal in the best possible of all ways. But she also doesn't, she does, she does something very straightforward with her language, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Yeah, definitely. She also does an incredible reading of that piece as well. I was lucky enough to see it live once and it was terrifying. Oh. The whole room was just... <laughs> and Mary Gateskill told me herself after that she too felt complete terror and fear as she was reading it. She was so into that reading um, and the room was just so still. Um, that reminds me of something I wrote down that you said. Uh, my favorite novels invite readers to see themselves in each character, no matter how destructive or how righteous, um, which I love so much and I feel in this book. I was also really struck by something you said about both Morrison and Torres um, sidestepping side expectation. Um, and the way, the way you worded that was so beautiful. And I wondered throughout reading this, how do you, is that something that you're really conscious of as you build each scene? Like, how do I sidestep what this person would do next or what I would do next? How do you constantly sidestep those expectations, which you do throughout? Oh gosh, I mean, I just try to look at the best possible examples. And also, you know, I don't, I don't people don't need to read fiction in order to, to in my opinion, to, um, to do like the average, just sort of, shitty decision-making that I do on a regular basis in my regular life. 
Um, you know, I think what I love about, you know, I ha my, my life was such that, um, you know, when I was very young and my imagination was at its peak, um, I, you know, I sort of felt like the world sort of chiseled away at it and kind of like took it away and took it away and took it away in a, in a weird way. Um, probably most creative people felt, feel that way. And, uh, um, and I think that, you know, I had really interesting um, ways of reacting in the world, but eventually I wanted friends and I wanted to be accepted. And um, when I was rereading um, Long of the Tribe of Fatherless Girls by audio, by the way, um, today, that scene um, where your character, and I always call autobiographical work um, your character rather than you because it's stylized and it's art. Um, but when your character is, uh, um, you know, on AOL in those chat rooms, it brought back this memory where I made up my um, alter ego. My friend, um, a friend of mine had a CB radio because I'm older than you. And I would spend hours alone waiting for him to come home. And this was after I left home. And I had come up with this alter ego named Hot Lips. Breaker 1-9, Breaker 1-9, this is Hot Lips. And I was like having fully inappropriate conversations with truckers that were asking me to meet them at the um, turnouts off of 495. Um, Mom, sorry if you're here. <laughs> <laughs> That's shocking to you. <laughs> but um, that was a memory that I brought back because I was just so desperately wanted to connect. And so what my desperation to want to connect forced me to do was try and fit in and try to be appropriate and try to have like modify the way that my body moved and sounded so other people would, would like me. And it's only because I completely failed at that that I think, um, I think that I was able to that I was forced sort of to find a different community and a different place to fit in. But still, I, I am average, like I'm just a regular human being. And so in fiction, I don't want what would happen to me. Mm -hmm. I want what would happen to me if um, I had control of language in highly emotional situations or do you know what I mean? I want I want more. Yeah. I'm gonna be thinking about that. <laughs> that's so what hard for me. Yeah, it's, that's so, it's, it's hard. Mm -hmm. Typically, that's I can only go there in revision. Like I always think about it in terms of is that a first draft idea or is that the revision where I can think that was the first draft idea? Perhaps that's what I would do. But how do I then sidestep that thing that I might do into something that will like kind of catch the reader? Um, which again, this does uh, in so many instances. Um, Let me I'm, give you a, a particular example to Kira, just for, okay. because to, to admit that you and I are exactly the same. It's, it's only in revision. So early on in the book, like Tom, right before the scene that I, I um, was reading, Thomas has to pee. There's a break in this thing and he has to pee and he goes into the bathroom. Mm -hmm. when to, and he's, so in the first draft, it was a, a bathroom where he got to be in alone. And in the second draft, I'm like, oh God, this would be so uncomfortable for me because one thing that really sucks about being a homo is public bathrooms. I know that some people like them in some ways, but it was like a place of real humiliation for me when I was growing up because people sensed that, like not in a good way that I was gay, but they called me a faggot and then didn't want me in the same bathroom with them. And I would have to like, and like high stress is not good for letting body fluids out into the urinal. So I hated bathrooms. And so of course me, Matthew, I don't want to portray what it's like to be in a bathroom with another person because I have to go deep into my imagination to do that. So I thought, but it'll be better for the story if a parent comes up to the bathroom while Thomas is there while he's essentially being grilled for whether or not he touched this kid inappropriately. But in the second or third or fifth draft, there was still a divider, which is between if you haven't been into the old things that they used to call men's room that should just be called restrooms that anybody should be able to go into at all times. But they used to have in what was called restrooms, dividers between the urinals. So you had like this tiny bit of privacy. And so that's how that scene was for many, many drafts. And then I thought, no, fucking yank out the divider, which made it all the more uncomfortable for me. And then, my editor, Michael, was just like, he literally said, describe the anatomy. Mm -hmm. 
And so I was just like, you know what? Mary fucking Gateskill isn't going to not describe the anatomy um, or the, you know, the virile um, flow of piss into the piss trap. And so, you know, I got to try it. And it's, it's, it was crit, like, I can't even tell you how bad the drops were on the way to me giving up. So me too. <laughs> it's like, there's I no love, way. I, I, I love getting a behind the scenes on that exact uh, scene, um, which is so striking to me in that opening chapter. When I say this opening chapter is a masterclass because we know what we're in for. We know what kind of intimacy and honesty that like, this is a book that, that pulls out that divider um, everywhere. And I like to use that exact word of like the ver, ver I can't even say that word, um, of the sound. Virile. Vir, virile, the sound of the piss um, and the grower, not a shower and how we like throttle in time in that moment as well. It's really a beautiful moment um, that tells us so much about the story we're in for. Um, so I know you've talked lots about kind of the, the moral panic at the core of the story and queerness and homophobia, but I am also interested as someone who has written a book about my family, um, about what drew you to, you shared a little bit of this already, but why, why the family and the family constructs and the chosen family and the biological family, um, it's just such a beautiful frame to bring to this book and a beautiful way to end this book, considering where we began, um, what is it about family? And I know you've got some family in the chat box here tonight too. Yeah, I read something today that from a um, somebody that I admire who who's estranged from their family because of their queerness. And you know, I think that I was estranged from my family for many years. The um, birth of my um, nieces is the thing that sort of brought my family unit back together in a particular way. And I really do feel like I had to get to know both of my brothers and also both of my parents as individuals, as an adult. And my mom really did show up for me during the AIDS years and got to know some of my, my two best friends that died of AIDS. And she still wears a necklace that my friend Chuck gave her. Chuck, when he found out that he was certainly going to die, he called every one of his credit cards um, and asked them to max out the amount that he could spend and then bought my mom like a ruby necklace. <laughs> and my friend a Birkin bag and then he died and <laughs> with all that debt. So um, Citibank paid for my mom's ruby necklace from Chuck. But the, um, so it wasn't just all bad and it wasn't all good in, in my case, but I do think that whether a person is adopted or whether a person is um, you know, born into a particular family or their chosen family, it doesn't have to be any particular thing, but it's almost like, for me, it's like a funhouse sort of mirrors. The thing that's really interesting for fiction and, and creative nonfiction for me about the family as, as form is that it offers, like so many people have a shared experience. And so it offers an opportunity to see different angles of that same, experience. And so when Thomas is reacting to something that's happening at the airport, James is going to see it completely differently. And Jake's going to see it even differently than that. And then the mom's going to have a reaction to it that's even different than that. And, uh, you know, so I think that that the and then also when people start coupling up, mm -hmm. I know you and I both are lucky to have in-laws that we're willing to visit and that we um, love and admire. But it's weird. It's just like then you start seeing yourself and the world in different ways because of your exposure and also having to get to know different parts of yourself. Um, so I think that it's just like the, the richest, ripest um, place to explore uh, various facets of a character. And I love the train for all of you. <laughs> um, <laughs> tell us about the train for a minute. Mm -hmm. Um, Ansu and I, during the pandemic, uh, moved to Oakland, uh, right above Jack London Square. We have a beautiful view of the water and these huge windows that you can see behind us. Um, and the only reason why we can afford to live in this particular apartment is because there's blaring train horns starting at 3.30 in the morning. They're so beautiful. <laughs> I love them. We've really gotten used to them and we've also able to sleep right through it with some white noise and some earplugs. <laughs> Um, everyone, in about five minutes, we're going to open up the Q&A, so please begin dropping some questions in there. Um, 
I want to ask you a little bit, Matthew, before I move to some some more community and, and teaching based questions, but um, your relationship in this book or your thinking through illness. Um, I thought about this a lot in terms of, you know, very literal technical illness of individual and also illness of a society, illness of culture, illness of country. Um, where, what, what was the root or core of that as you grew and evolved this book? I've also, I've always been a little bit superstitious. I think it absolutely 100% comes from my, my experience from believing with my entire heart and my whole soul that both my friend Chuck and my friend Richard, if I showed up for them when they were sick in the hospital, that they would live, that a cure would come. And when then they didn't and they died and that continued for 10 years and it was person after person after person from the restaurant where me and a bunch of people who are probably here all work together. And uh, uh, my first boyfriend ever who wasn't, I'm not, that wasn't the first person I was ever with, but the first person who ever claimed me in public. Mm -hmm. um, it died and all of those people died. I just could no longer, my psyche could no longer afford to believe that, um, that you know, good things could happen. I, I, sorry, I got caught up in that. And I sort of forgot the question for a second. I, I can feel it in the back of my head, but I got, I, so, I started just living that for a second and it cleared the board for me. You were saying about illness. I was thinking about illness on both a, a macro and micro scale um, yeah. in this book. So because of that, this is how I psychoanalyze myself and also what my therapist tells me might be true um, about how I had to organize my personality that I was terrified at some point with some article that I had been reading the entire eight years of the Obama administration because, um, because, it was, because so many people were seeing Barack Obama as a kind of um, symbol of progress and because gay marriage was starting to become legalized in state after state, I was just like, fuck, how is the pendulum going to swing the other way? And so I was reading, um, I think I was reading Jelani Cobb in The New Yorker and ta -Nehisi Coates before he became super, super, super famous in The, the Atlantic and um, others and just listening to a lot of conversations and what have you. And uh, I was just nervous about what was to come. And so in a weird way, Country Day, that particular community in Portland, who I don't think of as bad people. Um, and, you know, everybody wants to do well. Everybody wants to have food and shelter. The fact that people get there and have it, to me, doesn't seem like a problem. What seems like a problem to me is a belief that some people deserve that more than others, or that a human life has more or less value than another person's based on some sort of a marker. And so those were the things that I was nervous about in my own life. And they just kept coming in like, um, you know, when uh, John Renee, when John Benet Ramsey comes up in your book, how that sort of gives a that that's that what was happening in the news, and that's what we were seeing. Um, it gives it a sort of um, it, it takes it out of just that character's smaller situation, mm -hmm. and then it puts it into perspective about how this is like this is like part of the culture that's happening here, and I think that Thomas and his his situation is really those illnesses were there way before this thing got caught up in the collective imagination of that community. And I don't think, I don't, as the writer, don't think of it as their fault. Yeah, thanks for that, Matthew. Um, there's a question in the chat box that is actually related to my next question. I know you are working on the lab textbook and I also, had seen recently that you're also working on a novel that you've been working on for longer than you've been working on this book. Is that correct? Yes. Um, so I'm always interested in, as someone who has now, I've written a few books, <laughs> I've only mm. published one. Yes. Um, and I have been in some ways working on the same novel for 10 years. Um, how do you know, and, and this person's question in the chat box, this is your debut, but is it the first novel you've written? How do you, how do you honor the pacing of every specific project and know when something is finished, know when you've taken something the furthest you can possibly take it versus when you should put it on ice or put it in a drawer for a while? How do you figure that out with uh, these larger works, especially? 
For me, the way that I have figured it out is that like, you know, and I don't, I, I, I just don't, I don't want to like be disrespectful to anyone's privacy or whatever, but I, I haven't, like, I feel like I made my teaching career out of people getting like um, a big opportunity. Like they got a, a um, summer, re they got a residency or they got a, a presidential award so they could take a year off from teaching or, you know, they broke their wrist and needed to take a semester off or something. And I was standing in the office when the person doing the scheduling was just like, hey, I need somebody to fill in this, this class. Can you do it? And I was like, yeah. And the same thing, like I've had a similar thing with like agents in the business of creative writing where I have had like two year periods where I didn't even have an agent. So I didn't know what else to do except write because it's really t tricky to place a novel yourself. Um, and so I have never once um, felt that a novel has, or any project or even short fiction that I've published um, has ever like completely reached what it, what I, what I dreamed for it to reach, but I'm kind of glad because then it makes me want to write the next time. Um, and so for me, it's usually just like desperation. I'm uh, um, calling myself a writer. My friends get nervous for me because I'm calling myself a writer. They haven't seen anything from like for like two and a half years. So I start sending something out. And when somebody says, yes, we have decided collectively that that one is done. But if they say no and offer me some sort of good nugget that it could be better, then I'm going to go back and work on it because it's fun. I love revising. So um, I, I have to be honest. That's my, I don't have some big profound way. It was just like, well, Michael Nava, my managing editor at Amble Press was willing to take it in that condition. And so I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah. And yeah. Um... I love revising too. In some ways, I think I'll be working on the same novel for the rest of my life. But also something you say that resonates with me is like knowing that it's time to work on the next thing and that being really exciting too. Um, and that one of the best gifts I think I ever had was when I was working on a story for years and years and it's just like, it was okay. And uh, an instructor said like, I think this is the best that you could make it. Like, I think it's gone. I think it's the best it could be. And it's true because I was honoring the style of, of who I was at that time and what I was reading and what kind of writer I was. And it was time, you know, my style had changed and my interests had changed. And so I'm always interested <clears throat> in that process of like, when do we let things go and when do we revise forever? And I think um, there are cases to be made for both um, in my experience sometimes. Absolutely, absolutely. It depends on the, the project. And also I always I try to challenge my students. I said this the other night with Paul too, but um, I always challenge my students to think about that thing that they're, this, is, this was inspired by my mentor um, and now colleague and friend, Michelle Carter, where she, um, uh, she received a letter from one of her students that said, you know, I really want to, um, write about this thing that was so near and dear to her heart, but I'm so afraid that I'm going to get it wrong. And she turned it into a writing prompt where it was just like, what is that thing that you most fear about getting wrong? And for me, it's what it is to be a brother and what it means. And can we be our siblings keepers, both in, in the literal sense um, and then also in a more sort of worldly sense. Um, and also, you know, I think that the, um, the, Will, the, the, the willingness, I, I cringe at every single one of my journals, like my personal dear diaries that I have. I can't even look at them. My mom sends me letters that I sent to my grandmother. I can't even look at them. I can't even look at the handwriting. It just brings back so many visceral memories that I can't even look at them. But I have to tell you, and this might um, make me sound arrogant, but I cannot believe the things that I have published, that those things came out of me, given that, you know, where I come from, what was going on, the fact that the imagination that I was given that helped me get through a bunch of stuff, figured out a way to make a little tiny organized world out of the chaos that I had come from at the time that I had started writing, to me, it feels like such a blessing and such a um, unbelievable gift that I was given for survival and so many other things that I could never ever say I'm ashamed of that. I teach my first, I don't do it very often and I um, don't dwell on it if, I, if and when I do, but I occasionally teach the very, very first story I ever published. And I am so proud of that story. 
It, would I do it all differently now? Of course, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to be ashamed because that comes from the industry. Of, um, that comes from the 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 something else. But um, I think that we all deserve to be really proud of whatever it is that we've finished. Thanks for that, Matthew. I told you I might cry tonight. <laughs> there's, a, there's a really beautiful process question here in the box. Um, really interesting. When a character sidesteps an expectation, do you design aspects of another character in that scene to spotlight that? Thinking specifically of Jerome being more upset about the situation at times than Thomas. Yeah, um, great question. I can almost guess who that might be from, but I'm not going to try to figure it out. But the um, yes, in fact, in early drafts of Doubting Thomas, one of which my the agent that I had when I first finished the first definitive draft is veered into nonfiction completely and let go of her fiction clients. And I think that she kept me until pretty close to the end. Um, but and also it she let it be my decision to to search out a new agent but the poor person had to read so many so much of thomas's anger and then i at a certain point i was just like well what if i took this out of him so <clears throat> my anger matthew clark davison's anger isn't interesting it's reactive it's nothing new there's there's smarter people saying more articulate things about all of the things that i'm furious about um, and so for me, the challenge was to make Thomas more vulnerable and, and tender. And also I was super curious about what it's like to have been able to, to fit in and to assimilate and to be a good boy because I wasn't able to do those things. So um, I liked imagining what that must have been like for him because I also kind of resented gay people like Thomas and I also don't want to resent any gay person. So, um, I thought that that would be more interesting. And so basically I offloaded all of my basic anger onto Jerome, whose job it is to be infuriated on behalf of his clients. And the things that he's mad about are infuriated. So it's not just like he's being mad for no reason, but absolutely you caught it. Whoever asked that question, I just took my own fury and gave it to Jerome. <laughs> it's the fun of writing fiction. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the novel I'm working on now is about someone who just hates memoirists. And it's really <laughs> fun to just write those passages. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. <laughs> um, another question, why did you set the story in Portland? And I would like to take that question to the next step of um, why these three central places, uh, Portland, San Francisco, Colorado Springs. Um, yeah, how did you think through place in this book? Um, Portland seemed really great for me because at the time I was spending a lot of time there. Um, there there's two different times that I was spending a lot of time there. Soon after my best friend Emily moved there and um, we were visiting a lot. And um, so it just seemed great. It felt, having been from San Francisco, the, the two cities have some things in common. They have a kind of like um, very liberal ethos, but scratch the surface and underneath it, there's both present day, um, you know, all of the isms exist. Um, well, you know, the, the, I, you know, somebody, I was doing an interview and I, I did take my first creative writing class in the basement of uh, a neighborhood in San Francisco called the Tenderloin that people think of as really dangerous. And I'm like, well, I've never been fag bashed in uh, the Tenderloin or called a faggot, but I've been both in the fancier neighborhoods in San Francisco. So um, the, the, both of them just seemed really, I, I basically had access to descriptions of those three cities because my mom and younger brother are both relocated to Colorado Springs and Paul, my younger brother and his family lived there and so does my mom. And so I knew it. And then same thing with Powell, with um, not Powell's, Powell's is in Portland, with Portland. Um, I had access. And then eventually I thought, oh, you know, I can push on some of this. Like that grocery store scene where Thomas is shopping for pine nuts. That really happened to me. Like that is like <laughs> almost a verbatim, an experience, like the description of the person and also the interaction and also the price of cherry tomatoes. Like all of those things happened to me at New Seasons, one of the times where I was shopping. So um, 
lack of imagination and uh, access is the reason why <laughs> it's <laughs> said in those three places. Um, Matthew, I think I'd like to know, you mentioned how proud you feel of that first story of yours. And um, I just wanna give you a, a space. Tell us, what are you the most proud of with this book? Tell us what you love. Hmm. Well, I think, I think that the thing that I'm most proud, I promise I'll answer the question. I think that the thing that I'm, I'm most proud of is that I had become a very happy and satisfied person without a book in academia and in a, um, having put myself out there as a person who's a writer and who writes and who has been surrounded by people who are super successful in my field for decades, I figured out somehow a way to um, suffer dark nights of the soul far less than um, feeling lucky to have gotten everything that I've been you know, really blessed with. I'm 51, I somehow made it through the AIDS years. I feel healthier than I did when I was 30. I'm married to a person that I absolutely love. Every, I dated for a really long time and I, I'm a heterosocial. And so I had like deep loving relationships with a lot of people, mostly women, some um, wonderful femme and other kinds of people that, I mean, gay guys that, that um, you know, describe themselves in a lot of different ways. And then also my brothers and, and I just felt like, plus I had a date on Friday night, if you know what I mean. So I felt really, really lucky to have had all of those things. And um, I just felt like it would have been, for me to mope around and be like, oh, I don't have a book, would have been, uh, so I'm most proud of the fact that I had three books that never got published and that I still continued to write and be a productive member of my communities without bitching about it too much. That's what I'm most proud of. In this particular book, I think that the discovery for me was in the character Maddie. Mm -hmm. I think that there's a kind of way in which I came to understand um, perhaps my own and other people's um, depression and or reactions to both grief or trauma in a way that perhaps before writing the book, I was impatient about. I was raised really like get up, you know, pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Um, and when students who are millennials or Gen Zs are like, I have anxiety, I'm not gonna do it. I can't even, I'm just like, I have anxiety is the only reason I'm going to do anything. So I think that now I have a much more tender, I have more tenderness around the idea of people who really struggle to show up maybe those parts of myself and um, others. Maddie's not very much like my own mom in uh, those ways, but her strengths were really inspired by my, mo my own mom's strengths. I'm looking at this, uh, this part towards the end of your book, Matthew. All along, Thomas had thought he needed to be like his brothers. He didn't. He needed to be himself, more like his mom, not the Maddie sick with grief, but the Maddie who lived her own life. Um, well, thank you so much for this conversation, Maddie, Matthew. Um, thank you, Powells. I feel like I could talk to you forever. Um, and I, you know, we were just talking before this conversation uh, being introduced by Annie Wood and Evan Rehill, uh, former students of yours. And now I've been lucky enough to be in your classroom space. Um, I look forward to bringing this into my classroom spaces. And I think you are just such a centering force in the literary community. I'm so grateful for you for bringing so many good people together, um, for always supporting everyone else's work, for always supporting bookstores like Powell's. Um, thank you, Matthew. Um, I learned so much from you and I'm really, truly, truly honored to be here. Uh, Tikira, thank you. I, I just feel like if I try to say any more and thank you, <laughs> then bad things are gonna happen to my mascara and eyeliner. <laughs> Matthew, Tikira, it was such an honor and it was so wonderful to host you this evening. Thank you so much for this exceptional, as someone said in the chat, conversation. We hope that those of you in the audience will consider purchasing a copy of Matthew's new book by visiting us at pals.com. While there, be sure to check out our lineup of upcoming author events, virtual events. So we look forward to seeing you all at another one of our programs soon. 
Matthew, Tikira, thank you so much. We're grateful to have such a wonderful evening with you. Have a good night, everyone.